We're just about to begin tonight's lecture. Uh, unfortunately, you have me tonight instead of Julian Luxford, uh, who sadly couldn't make it down this evening. Uh, I have a couple of announcements before we start the lecture. Uh, one of which is, you'll notice there's some books on the table to my right. Uh, these are part of the library that Peter Ferguson left to the British Archaeological Association for us to, um, to sell on. I believe there's been a number of emails from Richard Plant about this, and some of you, I think, have either already signed up to buy some of the books, and Jana is putting your names on them. So if you're here, please can you collect the books before you leave, because we don't want to have to burden the antiquaries with them. The other announcement uh, is on behalf of Roshi Nastel, who has been organizing the British Archaeological Association Postgraduate Conference, which I know some of you have spoken at and some of you have attended. Uh, before COVID, we had it held it in person, and now I believe it is held online. And I'm just looking at the conference program, uh, which looks really wonderful. And it's going to be taking place uh, on Tuesday, the 22nd of November, uh, and Wednesday, the 23rd of November. And there's lots of great papers from uh, great up-and-coming scholars, and I think a real... Um, uh, a wonderful aspect of the programs that Roisin's put together is just to show uh, really how international the, the range uh, of speakers are that are coming to talk at the postgraduate conference. But for tonight, we have Jane Stewart, who's going to be uh, presenting a paper to us. And some of you might have recognized the title from a recent uh, issue of the JBAA, because Jane's paper uh, won the uh, Reginald Taylor and Lord Fletcher Essay Prize. And as some of you might have already read it, it's a really wonderful article. And it came out of a MA that Jane undertook at the Courtauld Institute of Art under Tom Nixon. Um, if I had the medal here with me, I would hand it to Jane in person. But unfortunately, uh, I was a bit slow at ordering uh, some new medals. So we'll have to have another... Uh, uh, um, Handover ceremony, perhaps at the at the next uh, at the next Lord Fletcher uh, and Reginald Taylor essay prize lecture. And for Jane, in thinking through this topic, it it opened up the possibility of doing a PhD, which she's now uh, undertaking with Tom at the Courtauld. And this is on another funerary monument, a much later uh, monument at Canterbury Cathedral, that of Sir James Hale. Uh, the late 16th century, and Jane was just showing me some images of that, that tomb, and it's really wonderful uh, maritime imagery, so hopefully we'll be able to see many more publications from Jane in the near future. But for now, uh, please join me in welcoming Jane, who will be talking about the Chantry Chapels of Cardinal Beaufort and Bishop Waynefleet in Winchester Cathedral. Jane, thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. And um, before I start, can I say a quick thank you to all the BAA members who gave me help during COVID lockdown when I was starting to research this topic. When all the libraries shut, we had an initial panic and a wobbly, but um, with a lot of help from BAA members and other people, managed to get the research material and get the project underway. So thank you. Chantry chapels of Cardinal Beaufort and Bishop Wainfleet attra attract the attention of any visitor to Winchester Cathedral. Their monumental scale, prominent position, flanking the now lost shrine of St. Swithin, and their elaborate canopied design positively demand to be noticed. They appear like giant versions of late Gothic canopied tombs. Their position by the shrine is similar to that of the royal tombs at Westminster and at Canterbury. Yet unlike those royal tombs, these huge chantry chapels must once have dwarfed the shrine that they originally flanked. The ostentatious nature of these monuments have, has ensured that they've received scholarly attention over a number of centuries, commencing with Richard Gaywood's etching of Beaufort's Chapel, published by Francis Sanford in 1677. The Society of Antiquaries commissioned Jacob Schneberly to draw the chantries in 1788, images which were reproduced in Vetusta Monumenta. 
Richard Goff described them as specimens of that perfection to which Gothic architecture seems to have been brought around the reign of Henry IV. Sir William Chambers and Sir Joshua Reynolds admired Schneebly's images, and Chambers thought it a pity that such beautiful pieces of Gothic architecture should be so neglected while our students were sent abroad to study the dull Grecian. More recently, the Chantry chapels have received only brief coverage in scholarship on funerary commemoration. The Chantries deserve greater attention. Extraordinary objects in their own right, their important survivals of monumental art created by two powerful bishops in the wealthiest sea in late medieval England. In this paper, I'll explore the history and context of their making, shedding light on why they were designed as such grandiose structures. Although they've been described as idiosyncratic, the chantries can nonetheless be understood as carefully planned acts of self-fashioning, reflecting important aspects of the two patrons' lives. The design of Beaufort's earlier chantry was a clear assertion of his status, making visual reference to royal tombs and especially to Westminster. But it may also depend on his extensive travel and exposure to art and architecture and the courts of Europe. I'll also consider the formal and conceptual pairing of the two chantries for prelates from very different backgrounds, their deaths four decades apart, and I'll explore the intentions of the patrons in their acts of self-fashioning and provision for the afterlife. The construction of both chantries was executed by Wainfleet, and as I'll show, the Beaufort design was adapted in Wainfleet's chapel to reflect a different set of personal and communal priorities. I'll then examine the paired chantry's role and function within the community and consider how they functioned as objects and architectural structures within the retro choir, close to the shrine and the lady chapel. The chantries are set in the middle bay of the large three by three bay 13th century retro choir of Winchester Cathedral, each built between two piers. They dominate the space here, although only occupying about 10% of the floor space, their height approaching the 43-foot high vault and their pairing near the center of the retro choir make them almost overpowering. Between them is a Hearst-style construction marking the, 15th the former site of the 15th century shrine of St. Swithin. The initial impression in seeing the chantries is a sense of their similarity created by their almost identical footprints, both protruding beyond the piers that flank them, and their dense pinnacle canopies extending into the retro choir arches. Both chantries are constructed as three bay designs, with four centered arched openings on three of their four sides, and a solid east wall providing the backdrop for rear adosses above and behind the altars. I should point out um, where I've put two separate images there, I tend to, I've put Beaufort's on the left-hand side to make it easier for you to recognize it can be a bit confusing looking at them. The central bay in Beaufort's chantry is almost entirely open with only a low balustrade framing the view of the tomb and effigy so that they are visible but out of reach. Wainfleet's, by contrast, is a much more sequestered space Although it's the later structure, it's more conservative, with its lower parts recalling the earlier chantries in the cathedral of bishops Eddington and Wickham, with side screens of uniform height. Wainfleet's metal bars may also have originally resembled those of Wickham's and Eddington's chapels. A drawing from 1715, up on the right, shows bars of a grid design, which may or may not be accurate, but um, it's Both chantries have a three-part fan vault with a higher central bay. In the center of the middle bays are demi-angels bearing the coats of arms of each prelate. Although in their current state, which re reflects some 19th century restoration, Beaufort's and Wainfleet's canopies are close in appearance, Beaufort's canopy was probably once populated with statues, and I've colored in yellow the niches for the statues to make it easier to 
discern where they are. Um, there are niches for 24 figures arranged on two tiers and perhaps filled with an assortment of kings, bishops and saints like the rear adosses of the high altar or of Wickham's chapel. Beaufort statues were presumably brightly colored like the figures from the great rear adoss where surviving fragments show traces of azurite, red lead, and vermilion. Wainfleet's has no spaces for figural sculpture within the canopy itself, but there are niches for four figures on the shafts below. The pinnacle canopies represent approximately a third of the chapel's elevations. Although they are open work, pierced structures, the sheer number of pinnacles and turrets makes them appear weighty in Francois Boucher's terms, they are anti-rational objects that could never exist in the sphere of large-scale architecture. Beaufort's canopy appears particularly substantial with its combination of open-work hexagonal towers and solid uprights faced with niches for the statues. The section above each of the three bays is divided into three elements, an emphasis perhaps reflecting Beaufort's devotion to the Trinity, evident from his request for masses to the Trinity following his death. The network of pinnacles and turrets on the canopy of Wainfleet's chantry is lighter in construction, with groups of delicate shafts tied together with crossed or trefoil braces and ties. Wainfleet's chantry is largely built of cornstone. Beaufort's is mostly Purbeck, with a lighter cornstone used for the canopy, combination also seen in surviving fragments thought to be from St. Swithin's shrine. The triple shaft clusters and carved capitals in Purbeck on Beaufort's chantry are also similar to these shrine fragments. The lower parts of Beaufort's chantry further li link the chapel with the retro choir where Purbeck is used extensively. Both chapels accommodate recumbent effigies on tomb bases. Beaufort's original effigy was destroyed in 1642 and the present one installed post-restoration, presenting him in a cardinal's hat and dress. There's debate about the materials used in the original effigy. A Lieutenant Hammond who saw the tomb in 1635 described his statue upon it in wood which may have been the surviving wooden core of a more elaborate effigy stripped after the Reformation. The wood may have been covered with gilded or silvered metal, resembling that of Henry V at Westminster. A choice of gilding would have emphasized Beaufort's royal credentials, his lineage referring to royal tomb effigies at Westminster, including the gilt bronze effigy of his grandfather, Edward III. A clue to the original appearance might lie in a 16th century drawing of Beaufort's funeral effigy made for Sir Thomas Ridesley, Garter King of Arms, which shows him in full pontificals with Bishop's mitre and the Cardinal's hat above. Wainfleet's effigy is of stone, largely original except for putty repairs made following defacement during the Civil War. He's attired in full pontificals with a richly ornamented mitre resting upon pillows and with an angel bearing his arms at his feet. Between his hands, his uplifted hands, is a heart. Beaufort's tomb chest is of Purbeck with deeply cut open work quatrefoil panels set with heraldic shields. A partial inscription, now lost, was recorded on Beaufort's tomb in 1601. Tribulare si nescirem misericordias tuas. I should tremble did I not know thy mercies. The tomb's double-decker form, albeit with a shallow upper layer, must have been intended to evoke the stacked tomb bases and plinths in the royal tombs at Westminster. At the four corners are twisted colonnettes, a quotation from Westminster, where Henry III's tomb employed this motif in reference to the confessor's shrine, a detail which may also have served to suggest Beaufort's link to St. Swithin's shrine. The stonework on the lower tier is backed by brass. This must originally have shone very brightly, but it's now tarnished. 
The upper layer is now covered with wooden quatrefoil fretwork, which isn't present in the 1788 Schneberly images and was probably added in the 19th century. Roger Quirk suggested that this was originally a band of gilded metal, which would have produced the opulent and radiant effect of the effigy lying within a golden coffin, also linking the tomb to St. Swithin's spirit tree. In 1635, Lieutenant Hammond described how Beaufort's effigy lieth within in brass and was strongly enfolded in brass. Wainfleet's tomb base is smaller than Beaufort's. It also has shrine-like twisted Purbeck shafts at the four corners, but the panels between them are of limestone with starred quatrefoils decorated with lilies, like his arms, which he took from Eton College. These were possibly also originally polychromed and gilded. The precise timings of the Chantry's construction are uncertain, as there's no known surviving documentation relating to their commission, design, or making. However, evidence from a combination of sources provides a broad time frame for the projects. Cardinal Beaufort's will, dated 1446, with later codicils, prescribed three masses for his soul to be said daily in perpetuity by three monks in the chapel where he would be buried. Although there's no description of the chantry in the will, it specifies that he be buried in the place which he had chosen and appointed. It also gives a list of a detailed list of items to adorn the space and for use during mass, including a crucifix, statues of the Annunciation, liturgical vessels, plate, and books. A further entry in the Priory Register, dated March 1460 records a renewal of obligations of the prior and convent, which was witnessed by Wainfleet, regarding the terms of Beaufort's will. The wording suggests the physical chantry was in existence at this time. It's not clear why this confirmation was deemed necessary 13 years after Beaufort's death, though it may have marked the completion of the chapel's construction. Wainfleet's will of 1486 requests burial in the tomb which has been provided in the eastern end of the cathedral in the chapel of the Blessed Mary Magdalene. This phrasing suggests that the monument was executed during his lifetime and was possibly already in use as a chapel by the time of his death. It's likely that he arranged for the chapel to be completed prior to the translation of St. Swithin to a new shrine funded by Beaufort in the centre of the retro choir between the two chantries. The lavish ceremony was conducted by Wainfleet in 1476. John Crook has described the erection of Beaufort's chantry chapel as one of three mutually dependent projects instigated by Beaufort but completed following his death in 1447, constituting a major reordering of the cathedral's east end. The other two were the construction of the great high altar Rerados and the creation of a new shrine base and reliquary for St. Swithin in the middle of the retro choir. As these projects were overseen by Wayne Fleet, it's possible that he coordinated his own chantry construction as an integral fourth part of the overall project. There are elements of detailing common to the, to the chantries and the Rerados including mouldings and a motif of a snail climbing on a rose seen in the north door spandrels of both the great screen and Wainfleet's chantry. There's a little snail there. And there. Julian Luxford included Beaufort's and Wainfleet's chantries within the category of stone cage chantries, enclosed chapels between piers with a tomb, a tomb and altar inside. The sense of vertical thrust in Beaufort's and Wainfleet's chantries sets these two apart from most other surviving stone cage examples, however. They strain audaciously up towards the top of the vault, curving slightly into the contours of the building almost seeming to want to push through the vaults in places. 
This is a departure from the strong horizontal lines of the lower, much more modest tops of other surviving stone cage chantries, such as those at Wells, Newark, or Bishop Eddington's at Winchester. Only the Trinity Chapel at Tewkesbury Abbey, built for Sir Edward Le Dispenser, achieves a similar sense of vertical thrust with a single spire-like tabernacle which breaks beyond the horizontal top line of the chapel towards the arcade above. Beaufort's and Wainfleet's are quite different from the four other Winchester chantries as well. Only William of Wickham's chapel strives for similar loftiness, but unlike Beaufort's and Wainfleet's, Wickham's doesn't dominate its surroundings. It's relatively small compared to the 79 feet high nave vault. Given the distinct features of these two chantries, it can be argued that Beaufort's chantry design is best understood in relation to his unique circumstances and that the design was later adopted and adapted by Wainfleet to convey his different status, ideas, and priorities. Cardinal Beaufort was the illegitimate son of John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford, later legitimized by the Pope in 1397. His birth made him the half-brother of Henry IV. He received early preferment in the church, being made Bishop of Lincoln in 1398, and then of Winchester following Wickham's death in 1404. As Bishop of Winchester, he enjoyed a reputation for being the richest prelate in Christendom. He played a leading role in political life, acting as chancellor and political counselor to Henry's fourth, fifth, and sixth and was a major source of finance to the crown, funding war with France. He also played a significant role in foreign diplomacy and trade relations, dealing with the emperor, papacy, and with France and Burgundy. Philip the Good was married to Beaufort's niece, Isabel of Portugal. Beaufort was made a papal legate in 1409 and cardinal in 1427. This combination of roles was contentious, as his retention of the See of Winchester as a cardinal was unprecedented and perceived as a threat by contemporaries. He was a powerful figure, but always insecure because of his illegitimate parentage. He didn't spend much time in the town of Winchester, ruling his see for most of his 40-year episcopate from his palace in Southwark, which was technically within the See of Winchester, or he was absent overseas on diplomatic trips and military campaigns. William Wainfleet's origins, by contrast, are somewhat obscure and poorly documented, although it's fairly clear that he was of lesser gentry stock from Lincolnshire. His elevation to the position of bishop of the wealthiest see in England appears to have been the result of academic prowess leading to royal patronage, after studying at Oxford, he became headmaster of Winchester College. He entered royal service in 1441 under Henry VI, bringing to fruition the king's plans for the new foundation of Eton College, where Wainfleet later became provost. Following Beaufort's death, he was promoted to the See of Winchester with the support of the king. Unlike Beaufort, he appears to have been active in his episcopal role, residing within the see for most of his episcopate. Although he acted as chancellor between 1456 and 1460, his main interests lay outside politics, and he used his influence to found educational establishments, most notably Magdalen College in Oxford. Like Beaufort, he was closely associated with the Lancastrian dynasty, but successfully navigated the turbulent politics of the Yorkist era, surviving into the reign of Henry VII, dying in 1486. <coughs> Surprisingly, given the close pairing of the chantries, there's very little record of a connection between the two men. The link between them depended largely on their roles as consecutive Winchester bishops, which meant Wainfleet inherited the task of executing Beaufort's vision for the combined projects of New Shrine and Reredos alongside the building of Beaufort's chantry.
while Wainfleet appears to have overseen the construction of Beaufort's chantry, it's unlikely that such an extravagant and idiosyncratic design would have been conceived without the close involvement of the cardinal during his lifetime. Numerous stylistic references to the contemporary monuments of Beaufort's Lancastrian relatives are discernible in the chantry, which can be read as a statement by Beaufort establishing his monument as part of a royal grouping. One of the most significant influences on Beaufort's design was the tomb of his father, John of Gaunt, and his first wife, Blanche, in Old St. Paul's, designed by Henry Evely and erected during Gaunt's lifetime. The tomb, now lost, was recorded in a drawing by William Sedgwick around 1640. This shows a canopied tomb with three bays and a profusion of pinnacles and multiple tiers of crocketed OG gables, possibly housing devotional statuettes. It's difficult to draw firm conclusions about the precise degree of similarity between Gaunt's tomb and Beaufort's chantry, as Cedric's image is quite sketchy. We do know that the tomb was admired by contemporaries, described as a sepultura incomparabilis by Michael Pintoin. The design of Gaunt's tomb was itself derived from the earlier three-bay, high-canopied tomb of Edmund Crouchbank at Westminster, and also the widely emulated tomb of Edward II in Gloucester Cathedral with its elaborate multi-layered canopy. A number of scholars have proposed Gaunt's tomb as the model for Beaufort's chantry. However, Beaufort's outstripped his father's tomb in both scale and ambition. His chantry broadly doubled the length and added about 50% to the height of Gaunt's tomb. It was inflated into something even more grandiose, outdoing the sepultura incomparabilis. It was also a much more complex structure, conflating chapel and tomb, whereas Gaunt's separate chantry was built across the aisle from his tomb. Beaufort's ideas about his own tomb and chantry and methods of self-representation must also have been shaped by his involvement as a main executor in the process of creating the tomb and chantry for his royal nephew, Henry V. These displayed an extensive sculptural program glorifying the king and linking Henry to Edward the Confessor, to Saints George and Denis, the jewel crowns of England and France, and to the heavenly court. Beaufort may even be represented by one of the two cardinals on the stair turrets that link the chantry and sanctuary. You can just about make them out in the far left and right. Um, Beaufort, as a major supporter of Henry's foreign policy, played a role in formulating the language of propaganda and myth-making following victory at Agincourt in 1415 portraying England and Henry as the chosen instruments of God's will. Although Beaufort's chantry was not formally indebted to Henry's tomb and chapel, it does emulate its rhetorical ambition, grand scale, and domineering presence near a shrine. It's quite probable that the canopy of Beaufort's chantry had statues of many of the same kings and saints as Henry V. Both Henry's and Beaufort's chantries and tombs were designed as sites of ostentation and ritual, with masses made visible to the public. Both chapels were dedicated to the Annunciation, and the 10,000 masses that Beaufort ordered to be said immediately following his death included a 1,000 for the Trinity, which also featured prominently in Henry's chapel and masses. Beaufort's rear niches on the right there are now empty, but it's likely that the three large niches displayed statues of the Annunciation, possibly flanking a central trinity or throne of mercy in emulation of Henry's rear dos. John Goodall and Linda Monckton suggested that the design of Beaufort's chantry drew on the monument of Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester in St. Albans Cathedral, which was planned as early as 1441-3 and was sufficiently advanced to receive his body upon his death in 1447. 
There are common elements such as molding details and the elaborate upper stories which intersperse delicate tracery details with solid uprights formed by stacked statue canopies. It also has a tripartite vault with a higher central bay. Goodall and Monckton also argued that there was a circle of craftsmen, including John Thirsk, who was probably Gloucester's master mason, and Richard Beak, working on prestigious commissions for royal patrons across the major ecclesiastical buildings, including St. Albans, Westminster, Canterbury, and Winchester, and that an overlap in stylistic details between the monuments can be discerned. In such a coterie of patrons or executors and masons, there would have been ample opportunity to hear of the plans of peers and rivals, to view drawings and to share and copy ideas. The wealthy and status-conscious Beaufort is likely to have employed craftsmen with a record of working on the most prestigious commissions. He almost certainly had contact with Thirsk while he was working on Henry V's monument. He also probably had contact with Beak in Canterbury, where Beaufort resided in his last years. Beaufort's chantry can perhaps be seen as a monumental riposte to Duke Humphreys. The two men had a particularly acrimonious relationship, jockeying for position in court and government in the reign and minority of Henry VI, a bitter feud which lasted a quarter of a century until their deaths in 1447. The location of Beaufort's chantry echoes Duke Humphreys. Both completely fill the arch of the bay immediately to the south of the respective saint's shrine. Both monuments represent a bid for status. The prodigious display of heraldry, together with the statues of kings, affirmed Gloucester's royal roots. Gloucester's monument consists of an elaborate pair of facades, like curtain walling, bolted onto the piers, but with a, no apparent functional purpose apart from marking the burial chamber below. It didn't contain an effigy, and its chantry altar was probably sited in a nearby bay. Beaufort's chantry aimed to surpass this by combining chapel and monument, keeping him, with his effigy keeping him visibly present and, until the Reformation, part of an ongoing liturgical performance in the large open hall structure of the retro choir. Gloucester's monument, tucked into the confined space at St. Albans in the narrow retro choir, is much less conspicuous. It's possible that Beaufort and his masons drew inspiration from non-funerary structures as well as royal monuments, perhaps, for example, the Neville Screen in Durham Cathedral, another complex canopied structure probably designed by Henry Evely. In addition, Beaufort's extensive travel and dealings with foreign courts, rulers, and popes may help to explain the ambition which is visible in the scale and complexity of his chantry. He must have been exposed to innovative artistic and architectural ideas and visual stimuli as he traveled across Europe. For example, he visited Ulm in 1417, where he was met by the emperor en route to the Council of Constance. And he went to Nuremberg in 1427, having been appointed papal legate for the kingdoms of Bohemia, Germany, and Hungary. Both these cities were undergoing transformation by Prague-trained artists who remodeled church interiors, urban settings, and invented novel micro-architectural edifices and church furniture, which drew inspiration from and acted in close dialogue with mac contemporary macro-architecture. In Ulm, Beaufort presumably witnessed the building program for the Minster, where an innovative tower of unprecedented scale was being planned. He might even have been shown the architectural drawings and spire designs of Ulrich von Ensingen, Masked of the Ulm workshop, such as Ulm Plan A on the left. It's conceivable that Beaufort's focus on upward reach in his chantry canopy was inspired by such impressive structures. He must also have seen ornate carved retables combining figural sculpture and microarchitecture in southern Germany, where a vogue for tall towers and superstructures developed during the 15th century. You have to excuse the slight cheat, the central image post-dates Beaufort, but I thought it was quite a good illustration of figurative sculpture and stretched up 
structures. Beaufort's tomb effigy, framed within the magnificent canopied chapel with its multiple niches containing statues, presents him like a recumbent version of a Lancastrian monarch within a royal seal, and perhaps exhibits a playful yet serious transfer of design. The great golden seal, the largest and most elaborate of all the English royal medieval seals, was created for Henry IV around seven years into his reign. This was a deliberate reworking of his first seal, which had been based on the 1360 Brittany seal of Edward III, and was dominated by the enthroned king, flanked by two large escutcheons set within a tabernacle structure with a few tiny figures. The reworked version on the left frames Henry's image within a considerably more elaborate tabernacle structure. The canopy above the king and the two outer sections are each subdivided into threes, the same numerical emphasis seen in Beaufort's canopy, with 21 stacked figures, including kings, saints, and animals, and small heraldic banners. The figures include the Virgin and Child, Saints Michael, George, Edward the Confessor, and King Edmund. Alfred Wyon interpreted the iconographical program as an attempt by Henry the usurper to invoke all the sanctions which might give sacredness to his claim and link him to a tradition of sacred kingship. Beaufort must have been conscious of the potent symbolism of the redesigned seal, which was also used by Henry's fifth and sixth. Beaufort acted as chancellor for each of these three monarchs and as custodian of the seal would have been in close contact with both the Bretigny and the redesigned version. Allusions to the golden seal in his chantry design emphasize his royal status and position at the heart of government. Although no documentation has been found that securely identifies those who worked on the chantries, Several local masons may be considered candidates, including Robert Hull and William Graver. Robert Hull was master mason at the cathedral from around 1411 and also worked on Beaufort's project at St. Cross Hospital in Winchester. Hull also worked at St. John's Hospital in Sherbourne, where he may have seen and been inspired by the Sherbourne Missal. The margins of the missile show complex, canopied architectural structures that resemble fantastical versions of Beaufort's chantry, with the abbot and bishop of Salisbury incorporated into the structures. John Goodall noticed a distinctive cross-shaped detail in the border panelling around the doors of Wainfleet's chantry, which appears to have been first used in the windows and doorways of Eton College Chapel from around 1460. A similar detail can be seen at Tattershall College Church and at Uelm on the tomb of Alice de la Pole. Wainfleet was a patron of elements of the building works on both Eton College Chapel and at Tattershall. One Winchester master mason, John Cowper, who served his apprenticeship at Eton College, is also documented as engaged on the Tattershall works around 1482, and a mason of the same name is shown working on other projects patronized by Wainfleet, including Wainfleet School in Lincolnshire. So it seems quite likely that he was involved with building works on Wainfleet's chantry. If the design of Beaufort's chantry reflected his personal and political circumstances, one has to wonder why Wainfleet, with his far humbler background, emulated the chantry design in his own monument. Grandiose canopied tombs had a contentious history, potentially threatening the liturgical, symbolic, and ascetic integrity of host churches, and could even be subject to removal. Even royal tombs had horizontal testers curtailing their upward reach and to avoid overtopping the shrines as at Canterbury and Westminster. The eye slip roll on the, the right here shows even the high canopied tomb of Edmund Crouchbank was once surmounted by a tester. A number of patrons chose to create pendant pairs of stone cage chantries 
reflecting a widely shared desire for symmetry and balance. Surviving examples include Tewkesbury, where the Founders' Chapel was planned to balance the design and position of the slightly earlier Trinity Chapel, or the Bubworth and Sugar Chapels in the nave of Wells Cathedral. I don't know, can you see the um, Bubworth and Sugar Chapels there? They slightly disappeared. Yeah. Um, in the case of the Winchester Retro Choir, it would appear that symmetrical pairing was not simply the result of a desire to emulate an admired model, but rather a necessity imposed upon Wainfleet because of the scale and prominence of Beaufort's chantry. Had Wainfleet not replicated his predecessor's design, the retro choir would have appeared very lopsided. The pairing restored balance, creating something akin to a triptych, with the chantries acting as enormous wings to the central shrine, almost turning the space into a giant altarpiece. Wainfleet was clearly respectful of tradition, but elements of his chantry design suggest that he was also engaged in creating something different rather than simply copying his predecessors. It's possible to discern elements of inventiveness in Wainfleet's design with a subtle updating and critiquing of the earlier models, perhaps in part to stave off potential criticism about intrusiveness. There are elements of the detailing and design which differentiate the chantries and convey different messages. Beaufort's austere lower section of Purbeck with shaft rings and base, shaft base moldings that echo those of the retro choir peers link him to the physical church, demonstrating his special status as the episcopal embodiment of ecclesia, reflecting one of the fundamental precepts of medieval canon law. You are to know that the bishop is within the church and the church within the bishop. And so if there is no bishop, there can be no church. Bishops were frequently likened to the columns of the church by medieval writers and the material church was often described as constructed of living stones, a reference to the epistles of Saints Peter and Paul. Wainfleet's chantry has a much more decorative exterior with delicately carved details on the screens that invite close looking. A frieze on the niche base in the northeast corner shows wrestling figures, while tiny musical figures can be seen together with animals at, on the buttresses at door height. There's also a series of grotesques on the cornice inside the chapel, recalling misericords or the margins of manuscripts. Such images must have resonated with the monastic community, offering a witty foil to solemn commemorative masses, possibly deflecting any charges of pomposity or pride targeted at the scale of the chantries. They induced the beholder to stop and look, to feel a connection to the individual buried within. They act as a rhetorical device, captatio benevolentiae, to captivate, win favor, and thus engage the viewer's charitable instincts and intercessory prayers. Wainfleet's choice of Mary Magdalene for the chapel's dedication also reflects his close relationship with the monastic community. The Magdalene provided a model for the contemplative life of prayer, thanks to her fidelity, obedience, humility, penitence, and rejection of worldly goods. Wainfleet's Episcopal seal depicts him within a canopied structure, kneeling below Mary Magdalene, as well as Saints Peter and Paul, to whom the cathedral is dedicated. This configuration may have been replicated in the rear dos of his chapel. Beaufort's plan to create a more splendid and visible shrine augmented the prestige of the cathedral, encouraging greater numbers of pilgrims. Swithin Shrine was one of the most important in southern England after Becketts, and many pilgrims broke their journey to Canterbury at Winchester. The two magnificent chantries flanking the shrine enhanced the sense of specialness, guarding the precious shrine like sentinels. The dual chantries also have the effect of creating a circulatory system within the large open hall structure of the retro choir, channeling the flow of people who could glimpse the shrine as they moved around the chantries. 
A contemporary account of the lavish translation ceremony of St. Swithin's relics in July 1476 provides some sense of the importance of procession and movement within the retro choir. It describes how the relics were carried in solemn procession around the town of Winchester on a portable ferritory attended by Wayne Fleet, senior clergy, nobles, and a huge crowd. This was followed by a mass, after which the prelates, dressed in pontificals, devoutly carried the precious relics from the altar to the place where they now lie, with joyful singing accompanied by joyous organs and other kinds of music. And in procession, making their way to the place where a marble tomb had been constructed for the glorious saint upon a silver and gilt reliquary, upon which a silver and gilt reliquary had been placed. Those prelates who were capable of it climbed a ladder which had been erected from the ground to the reliquary. The Bishop of Winchester entered the reliquary and having kissed the relics with great devotion came out again, as did all the other prelates and certain lords. After this, the hatch was closed and the ladder taken away and outpourings and prayers to God were made. While there's no record of specific ceremonies taking place in the retro choir after the translation, the space seems to have been designed with procession in mind. The chantries would have been on the processional route to the Lady Chapel, where the Marian feast days were celebrated with special pomp. Winchester had a long tradition of prestigious burials near Swithin's grave, both in the Old Minster and later in the new cathedral. The relocation of the shrine to sit between Beaufort's and Wainfleet's chantries supplanted the pre-conquest figures and afforded the two bishops highly privileged access to the bishop saint at the hierarchically important east end of the cathedral. The performance of masses within the chantries, increasing the overall sum of masses said, could also be seen as honoring the saint in what is described in the golden legend as the debt of interchanging neighborhood a mutually supportive and beneficial relationship between individuals on earth and the saints in heaven. The location of the chantries in such close proximity to the shrine perhaps even implied some element of co-sanctity, a message reinforced by Beaufort's golden tomb base and possibly effigy and the twisted Purbeck colonnettes at the corners of the tombs. Compartmentalization of the retro choir, with the great new Reredos shutting it off from the western part of the church, shifted focus eastwards towards the adjacent Lady Chapel. The souls of Beaufort and Wainfleet would benefit from daily masses occurring there, in addition to the three daily masses performed within each chantry. The placement of the chantries alongside Swithin and in close proximity to the Lady Chapel can perhaps be read like a devotional image from a manuscript or panel painting, with Swithin effectively presenting the bishops to the Virgin. As a regular visitor to the Burgundian court of Philip the Good and Beaufort's niece Isabella Burgundy, Beaufort may have encountered this type of visual imagery used in a funerary context, in popular Netherlandish wool-mounted memorial panel paintings and sculpted relief tablets depicting the deceased presented to the Virgin by personal saints. Beaufort's likely to have seen images such as Jan van Eyck's celebrated Madonna of Canon van der Parla in St. Donatian's Church in Bruges, where it was linked with a double chantry foundation and may have had a memorializing function. Wainfleet shared Beaufort's devotion to the Virgin his will requested 5,000 masses for the joys of the Virgin following his death, as well as for the five wounds of Christ. Christ. These prayers may have represented a continuation of masses conducted in the chantry during his lifetime, and it's possible that he used the chantry as a personal chapel before his death. The heart in the hands of his effigy also links his deceased self and his living devotional practice representing the Sursum Corda, lift up your hearts of the liturgy. Depictions of hearts were popular in contemporary monumental brasses as expressions of faith, hope laid upon my bosom. The heart was central to salvation, cleansed by faith, 
and the epitome of the soul, serving as a communicator to the more removed and mystical spheres. It's also possible that Wainfleet's chantry was used for elements of his funeral rituals. The physical structure of the chantries is reminiscent of funerary catafalques with extravagant towering displays of candles, such as those at the funerals of Abbot John Islet or John Duke of Bedford. The design of Beaufort's and Wainfleet's, Wainfleet's chantries blurs the boundaries between commemorative rituals and commemoration in stone. Both Beaufort and Wainfleet conceived of their monuments as part of a wider network of commemoration, creating spaces devoted to prayer for their souls and the preservation of their memory well beyond the confines of the cathedral. Beaufort founded an almshouse of noble poverty and rebuilt the entrance tower at the Hospital of St. Cross in Winchester. He also left legacies to numerous institutions, including Christ Church and St. Augustine's in Canterbury. Wainfleet founded Magdalen College and Magdalen College School in Oxford, as well as a grammar school with a chantry function in Wainfleet, Lincolnshire. Examination of the chantries in terms of their patronage, construction and function sheds light on their striking designs. Cardinal Beaufort's monument established his royal credentials and status as Cardinal Bishop. He emulated royal tombs, but aimed to surpass them, inspired in part by art and architecture encountered on his travels. Wainfleet's creation of a second chantry, similar but subtly different, helps to shape the surrounding space for communal ritual and prayer, as well as for the reception of pilgrims. The two chantries represent a complex package of strategies for the afterlife of the two bishops. They were a highly privileged space, powerful tools for salvation, keeping the deceased visibly present, engaging the viewer, eliciting intercession and evoking memory. Their ambitious, highly distinctive design and their proximity to the shrine and lady chapel sets these two chantries apart from the other Winchester ones. These monuments served to establish the two bishops as members of the special dead, but also created a space where they remained part of the living community. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you so much, Jane, for such a, uh, a wonderful close reading of, of uh, two very different people, but two very similar tombs. And, uh, and I was describing this material to Jane before is catnip for the for the BAA. So uh, I'm sure there's going to be lots of uh, lots of questions. So if I open up the floor to any questions from the room, Jana will bring a microphone. <laughs> is there any evidence for Wainfleet's patronage at Magdalen College and architects that might have been working between between Winchester and and Magdalen in nothing has been um, shown there that the um, I have read that he wasn't always that impressed by some of the Oxford architects, and so he was looking for other people to be involved in his chantry, but I'm not sure quite how true that is. Thank you very much for a, for a splendid paper. Um, can I ask about um, um, Wainfleet holding his his Heart. I mean, that so often happens on specific heart tombs, which this clearly um, is not. Um, Winchester does have a particularly fine... I have got a slide of it, so I'll just try and get it up here if I can manipulate the mouse. Get this down. I had to 
uh, omit it from this, Lindy, because of time. Can somebody help me? I'm sorry, I'm being really inept getting... Um, I, I was just going to say that when she does have... Um, Aimer de Valence, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Is that what's your, what you're trying to find, I which to is a hot thing, that so I, I can get, I've got some, but, a few more um, slides at the end. Anyway. Maybe I'll just... There we are. Uh, th there is a, a very clear reference. The position is almost identical, isn't it? Um, but I think it, given the terms of his will that talk about his body being buried in the chantry, I don't think there's any intimation that it was a, a heart burial for Wayne Fleet. Um, and it was very unusual after about 1299 to have heart burials, wasn't it, after the papal bull. Um, but it, the, the reference to it is very striking, isn't it? And maybe it's him wanting again to refer to the tradition of the cathedral. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a, <clears throat> a wonderful paper. Um, it just struck me looking at this um, coming from the 16th century, is that I, I'm struck by the fact that these um, uh, late 15th century chantries read, as you've rightly analysed and suggested, like screens. I mean, they, they, they work as screens, and their typology is very much based on screen architecture. In the early 16th century, the chantry chapels really are like little, not so little, but they're box tombs set between... between um, between the pillars, as with uh, Fox and Gardner. I just wondered if you had any reflection on what that says about different kinds of ritual or changing ritual of, of the mass within or through these um, different kinds of construction. I, I'm not in, enough of an expert, really, to speculate that much, but I think it seemed to me they are very performative spaces constructed here, and each of them has a door on the north and south sides, almost inviting people to move through them. So I don't think people are just looking at them as screens um, to admire from afar. I think there is a design that um, makes people participate, and it, we can only speculate who was allowed to go in and out of the doors, or um, I mean, we know that many pilgrims would have walked around them and looked at them, but uh, probably the allusion to screens would have been missed by many of them, wouldn't it? Um, I don't know. I'm sort of toying with the ideas and mulling it over, but I, I think there probably was a connection between some of the smaller objects that people looked at and the large objects, and um, there would have been many meanings there for them that we're not quite clued up on, really. Sorry, that's not very... Thank you for your very interesting paper. Um, what uh, has always struck me is about these two, and of course the reciting of the tomb, is this is a very large space that was probably not available to the public before mm. the sign shrine was recited. So it was, an, it was probably, in effect, um, an indoor cemetery. And that there were, uh, and we've still got them, there's, there's one for a start, um, a number of displaced uh, tombs, monuments, and the like. Yes. Uh, is there any sort of idea of how that was organized before? I mean, it, it was a lady chapel, and presumably the monks, therefore, uh, and celebrated there, and therefore the, the, the tombs and things would no doubt have been put into the arcades or against the walls so that they could process and the like. So it's pretty likely these two chances have displaced Possibly. somebody. <laughs> Do we know anything about that? The um, patron of the retro choir, Godfrey de Lucy, is thought to have been buried there, possibly right in front of the Lady Chapel. And so I think um, it is 
often considered that it was designed to be an Episcopal pantheon. Um, but I think there isn't much evidence now to show exactly where people are. Um, it's certainly possible that people were displaced. Um, there is a marker, a small um, site where they think Godfrey de Lucy is, and then um, later people have gone in. But um, I, I don't know anything more precise than that. Sorry. Um, you mentioned something about a Latin inscription that had been lost on yes. one of the tombs, and I was wondering if there were any other uses of text in these monuments, like an epitaph or maybe a plaque nearby, and if not, how would have information have been transmitted to viewers about that? There may place? well have been other um, written pieces there, but often because they were on brass or more valuable materials, they were stripped during... Um, either the Reformation or the Civil War. So that tiny tantalizing fragment is all that survives from either Chantry, unfortunately. Um. Um, amongst the hundreds of fragments that have been found of figures, most of which have been associated, of course, with the great rear loss by Philip Lindley and others. Yeah. Are there any candidates for filling those niches that you thought had sculptures, which obviously did have sculptures in them? I can't um, remember. Philip Lindley has suggested that there are two, which he um, identified as a monk and a nun, which he thought might have come from Wainfleet Chantry, because he measured them and um, the, the niches on both Beauforts and Wainfleets are only just over a metre high. And so they couldn't have taken um, many of, of most of the sculptures, but this particular monk and nun, he's written about that. It was in the, one of the transactions of the Harlexton Symposium. Um, and he suggested that these would have fitted um, Wayne Fleet's chapel, but presumably have been on the outside um, niches. And that may have been intended to speak once again to the monastic community if they were from there. Um, but, uh, but nothing unlike for, nothing for Beaufort, then. Nothing for Beaufort, unfortunately. Uh, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I had a question about Wayne Fleet, who I think um, was possibly or definitely responsible for commissioning the wall paintings at Eton. Um, so I just wondered whether this, his Chantry Chapel was, how consistent was it with any potential wider patronage? Well, I think that, I did wonder about that, that he is um, also thought to have um, patronized Flemish artists, perhaps with some of the Riradoss statues for the great screen. Um, and so I, that partly gave me the idea of the connection between um, Flemish devotional imagery and the funerary art. Um, that I think in Wainfleet's um, period as bishop, Netherlandish art was becoming increasingly popular in England um, after Edward IV's um, exile in Flanders, and then the marriage of um, Margaret of York to Charles the Bold. So I think there was a lot of toing and froing, and so I, I do wonder if the idea of devotion to the Virgin and the positioning of the chapels in relation to the Lady Chapel may have linked in perhaps to some of his discussions with the painters at Eton um, on those grisaille wall paintings. Um, but there's nothing to tell you definitely, but it's a tantalizing possibility that it, it does seem that he was very interested in Netherlandish art. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I loved your, um, uh, the, the description that you produced of the, um, the translation of the shrine with these bishops having to scramble up a ladder and Climbing. crawl into the, the reliquary and, and and that sort of thing that they had to scramble up if they could. Yeah. Um, and it, um, it, 
it raises a sort of different impression of uh, these um, liturgical events. You know, you assume that they're going to be very, very carefully choreographed. I mean, that just sounds as though it was asking for terrible trouble. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Um, and I just wondered if, if you had... You know any any other examples or any any of of similar precarious activities? By, by I bishops. haven't, unfortunately. <laughs> I have been looking, or, or, but or what um, you thought crawling into this reliquary exactly involved? Goodness knows, but um, it must have been quite extraordinary, mustn't it? Some portly people, perhaps, as well, squeezing into the narrow holes to get in there. Not that dignified, I think. There, there is a, an account of um, the, cons, uh, the bishop consecrating uh, the cross, one of the crosses at, um, at Salisbury, mm. um, which are about eight foot off the ground. And there's talk, talk of, a, of him reaching it. I don't, think, I don't think it actually says ladder, but he must have had something like yes. that. And it was on a, you know, the idea that there might be, you know, Bishop in his pontifical, you know, building site, getting onto a. It all sounds ladder. a bit Heath Robinson, doesn't it? Yes, I mean it's, it's very curious. But that, that, that's that's a, that's that a good example. example. Yeah. Thank that's you. A bit early. Um, that just leaves me to say thank you again, Jane, for a wonderful lecture and to remind everyone that the next lecture coming up in the series is by Frank Woodman, and it's gonna be on the Abbey of Santa Maria Amare on the 7th of December. So hope to see you all back for that lecture. Um, but before we go, would you just join me again in thanking Jane for a really wonderful paper? <laughs>